Welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Schatz and I'm an Associate Professor of Computer Science and Biology. Today we'll be talking about how genomics impacts modern life. We will welcome any questions that you have uh, by entering them into the chat module on your screen. There's going to be a few times throughout the presentation while I'll, I'll pause to take questions. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump right into the presentation. So just to start, let me tell you a little bit about myself and some of the things that my lab uh, works on. Uh, my research has been in genomics for about 20 years now, and we're really interested in understanding the structure and function of different genome sequences. Uh, so shown here is the familiar double helix. Of course, we're very interested in that molecule and, and uh, how it operates. But really what my lab really focuses is on are the ACs, Gs, and Ts, the individual nucleotides that are uh, arranged along the genome in order to spell out genetic messages. Our work is sort of focused on two major application areas. About half the time I focus on human genetics and the other half of the time I focus on agricultural genomics. Within human uh, genetics, we focus on sort of investigating the genetic origins of many important diseases. Uh, uh, currently, we have a lot of focus on different forms of cancer. We've also done a lot of research into the genetic origins of autism spectrum disorders and other, uh, and other major diseases. On the agricultural side, we think a lot about um, how we're going to feed the world, where we look at major crop species like rice or corn or wheat, uh, and which we think about um, how their different genomes impacts how well they grow, how they can live in different environments, and how we're, how we're going to be able to increase their yields uh, for many years to come. What's interesting, though, is I'm not really a biologist by training. I'm a computer scientist by training. And that's because your genome, the ACs, Gs, and Ts, is this enormously long and complicated molecule uh, that requires very sophisticated software to be able to analyze and make sense of. So I'm a computer science by training. I think a lot about how to write software, how to develop computer systems that can be applied at very large scales. In addition, I think a lot about new technologies for sort of making measurements uh, of molecules inside of cells. So we can, so at this point, the technology exists where we can isolate a single cell out of your body or out of some tissue, look at the genome, uh, look at sort of what other molecular activity are, are happening inside of there, including with single molecule resolution. These advances were just not possible just a few years ago, uh, which is just a testament to how quickly these technologies are advancing. Today, what I'm gonna do is, is sort of give you a little tour through how genomics is impacting modern life. Uh, to do this, I'm gonna start uh, just by a few minutes sort of introduction, talking about what is DNA, how can we sequence it, some sort of you know, very broad introduction to the field. And then I thought I would do kind of a deep dive on two major uh, topics that I think will be touching the lives of basically everyone on this call today. The first one I want to talk about some of the sequencing we're doing here at Johns Hopkins, looking at the SARS COVID-19 uh, viral genome. Uh, and, and, and I'll tell you about how we've been able to sequence it out of the patients that are present there, uh, do some comparisons between the viruses to look at how that's mutating and being transmitted. And then the next major topic I'll talk about is how we're applying some of these same DNA sequencing technologies to study human disease, in particular studying breast cancer. We'll talk about some of our latest adv advances there in order to develop uh, very detailed profiles of, of genetic risk uh, to really understand the origins of that disease. At the end, uh, I'll give you kind of a little sneak peek into the future. We'll talk about some new technologies, some new ideas that we're working on uh, that I think are going to really be impactful uh, very broadly across genomics. So let's dive in here. So DNA, uh, as I mentioned, is this, is this uh, very, very important molecule. Uh, inside of all of your cells, you have a copy of it. And your DNA, along with your environment and your experiences, really shapes who you, who you are. In some, in some ways, the shaping, I mean very uh, uh, specifically, you know, how tall you are, for example, is a highly heritable trait. You know, for me to, to guess how tall you are, well, I can look at your parents, I can look at your immediate family members, what I'm, uh, and I can come up with a very good prediction of how tall you'll be. And that's because the sort of the uh, genetic basis for it is very strongly encoded in your genome. It's very distributed. There's lots of var uh, variants that contribute a small amount to height, but is very, very um, profoundly present. Other physical characteristics like your hair, your eyes, skin color, again, there's a very strong uh, genetic uh, uh, component to that. 
for other characteristics like susceptibility to disease or uh, drug treatments, even how long you live or some of your cognitive abilities are very much influenced by your genome. Although of course you can't look at it in isolation. You also have to think about your environment, your experiences, all of these things in, in combination uh, shape who you are. So of course, for as long as we've known about DNA going back to the 1950s, there's been a lot of interest to sort of sequence it and study it so that we can decode these ge genetic messages to really learn more about ourselves and about the world around us. Uh, in, in humans and like us, um, uh, your body is made of, of a few trillion cells, um, maybe five or 10 trillion cells. And each of those different cells carries more or less an exact copy of the DNA uh, uh, that is present. Uh, your, the size of this is, is quite astounding. Um, so each cell will have about 3 billion nucleotides. Actually, it's about double that because humans are so-called diploid species where we have two copies of every chromosome. So it's actually about 6 billion nucleotides of DNA are all compacted inside of each cell. In fact, if you were to take that DNA and stretch it out, it'd be about two meters long. And if you take that two, million, that two meters long times the tens of trillions of cells in your body that you produce over your lifetime, this would be approximately one light year worth of DNA is created by all of us over our lifetime. It's just a staggering amount of DNA, a staggering amount of genetic information that is copied there. What's really interesting though is, you know, every cell in your body more or less carries an exact copy of the same DNA, but obviously your body does many different things, right? If you think about your, you know, your bones are very hard and stiff, your blood is a fluid, your skin, your neurons, your stomach, you know, uh, all these different organs, all these different cell types all share the same DNA. They just sort of um, are, are sort of uh, uh, take on different um, aspects of the DNA are activated. A useful analogy of this is, you know, we could all carry around our smartphones and sometimes my smartphone is a game. Sometimes it's a video player. Sometimes it's a web browser. Sometimes it's an email client. It is the same hardware. It's the same software on, on this phone. And then it all depends on what sort of program is being executed, controls what that phone is doing. In the same way, all of your cells carry more or less the same DNA, but depending on which genes are activated, will determine uh, what the properties of those cells are, or those tissues, be it your, your bones, your brains, your blood, your skin, your hair, all these different things. Um, it's the same, same genome, just gets sort of activated, just gets turned on and off in different ways. And that's how we can give rise to all these different organs and cells. Uh, the origin, so again, going back to it, so the, the structure of DNA, that familiar double helix structure was discovered in the 1950s. And then basically immediately after that, it was recognized how important it would be to study DNA sequences in order to understand uh, the basis of genetics. Uh, over the years, there are many sort of approaches to sort of analyze it. Uh, the earliest approaches, you couldn't isolate, you know, you couldn't read off the particular sequences of ACs and GSTs. You could just sort of, um, sort of take a summary and say, well, in your body, you have uh, approximately um, a ratio of this many A's, the C's, the G's, the T's. But over time, instead of just getting sort of a broad ratio, the technology improves where you could actually read off the specific nucleotides. One of the major advances from this was uh, led by an individual, uh, Dr. Fred Sanger, and he developed a protocol that you could actually reliably sequence DNA uh, at, at, at the time at very high throughput. And shown here is sort of a result of this where you would, take DNA, you would take DNA from cells or from the environment or whatnot, you'd prepare it in a special way, you would expose it to radiation, and then depending on what the particular patterns of nucleotides were in the DNA, we could actually visualize this um, sort of like taking um, a, 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 a photograph like you would with a film camera, where you would expose it to light and then it would glow different colors uh, depending on uh, what was present there. And then by eye, you would just sort of trace off the different bands, and that would tell you what the sequence of DNA was. This worked. This, this protocol uh, was, was really important for being able to read off the first segments of DNA. The very first genome sequence comes from a little virus genome called the bacteriophage. Uh, and it was really sort of a landmark discovery in order to develop this protocol. The challenge with it, though, is on a very good week, you could only sequence maybe 5,000 nucleotides in a row. Now your genome is uh, 3 billion nucleotides long, so this would be thousands of weeks of effort uh, to sequence one genome. It was just way too slow, way too expensive, way too cumbersome to apply at scale. However, over the next, so that was in the 70s, over the 80s, we saw the rise of automated sequencing instruments. And then this really leapt forward in the, in the 90s to the point where 
you could basically set up uh, ma massive sequencing facilities that could sequence mar larger and larger genomes. In the, in the 90s, we saw the rise of the first uh, free living organisms being sequenced. The first was a bacteria called Haemophila influenzae uh, that was sequenced at the Institute for Genomic Research, Tiger. In fact, I, I happened to work at Tiger, uh, although th this was a little bit ahead of when I was there. After the first microbial sequences, we saw the rise of even larger sequences. We saw a, a variety of plant and animal species being sequenced. There were fruit flies, there were worms, uh, there were other plants that were sequenced. These are all what are called important model systems. Uh, fruit flies, for example, can grow in a test tube and basically sugar water. Uh, but interestingly, they have very important and recognizable traits, like the colors of their eyes, the shapes of their wings, so that because you can grow them so quickly and you can keep track of them, you can really figure out a lot of their genetics just through the naked eye. In fact, some of the first maps of how DNA were organized, a so-called genetic map, were developed in the 1920s before even the structure of DNA was, was recognized, just by a very sort of careful accounting of how these different traits would recombine in different generations of fruit flies. And then eventually this led in the early 2000s to the first publication of the human genome. Uh, this was a, really an enormous accomplishment. Uh, it was sort of coordinated through this massive international effort um, to be able to be able to sequence parts of the genome, uh, piece it together computationally, and then be able to do analysis of that. Uh, so in fact, there are actually two publications of the human genome. Uh, one was from this large public effort, the International Human Genome Consortium. And then there was another effort actually at a private company, Solera Genomics, uh, that was, uh, had also assembled and uh, sequenced the first, uh, uh, first human genome for the very first time. So it's really a landmark achievement in a, you know, in a thousand years, I like to think people remember, this is one of the great successes of this era was the technology was developed to the point where you could actually go in and read entire human genomes for the very first time. Just, uh, there was tremendous interest to do so way before that, it just, the technology just did not exist, but now it does. And now we do it uh, quite routinely. A few years ago, uh, we had done some analysis about how many genomes had been sequenced and where the field was heading. At the time, there were maybe 100,000 genomes that had been sequenced, but we had made predictions that by the year 2020, we expected to see many millions of genomes. And I'm very sort of proud to say that when you look now in the field, th those predictions have totally come true. Uh, that to date, there's been, more, there's been several million uh, whole human genomes that have been sequenced using this great technology. Um, to read off in a very automated and very efficient way. A lot of this today is done for biomedical research, where if you're interested in uh, different diseases, their sort of, especially their genetic underpinnings, you know, very practical, important things to do is be able to go in and sequence the genomes. We can compare the genomes of people with the disease to those that do not have the disease, really try to isolate, you know, what is it that is special in the genomes of people with the disease? Um, that can often give you a lot of great clues about uh, uh, where those diseases come from, it also gives you great clues about how you might treat them. Interestingly, though, there's many applications beyond disease research. Uh, a very sort of um, interesting and fun thing to do, frankly, is to do your own ancestry analysis. So if you've ever uh, sent your, your saliva away for analysis to 23andMe or other companies, they're using a lot of the same technologies that I'm going to talk about here that can read off snippets of the genome, and then you can compare your genome to other people in the world, you know, find your ancestors, find distant cousins, do lots of interesting things there. In addition to human genomes, there's lots of efforts to, to basically look at all the major plant and animal species, all the microbes, all the fungi, basically every free living organism on the planet. There's some interesting, there's some interest to do sequencing of it, uh, especially now that the costs and the efficiencies have really improved throughout the years. One of, the, one of the amazing things is the technology for sequencing genomes has, ha, has continued to advance at really substantial rates. Uh, the way that the human genome was sequenced was a, sort of a supercharged version of that early protocol uh, where that had to expose the DNA to radiation. It works, but it's, it's still kind of cumbersome, uh, still rather expensive to do at scale. But there's some very new technologies that let you do some very uh, remarkable and exciting things. So one of these comes from a a, a private company called Oxford Nanopore, and they have a handheld DNA sequencer, a nanopore sequencer, that I think is truly state-of-the-art in the field. So it's a handheld device. It's a little bit smaller than your iPhone. I, I usually have, I have one in my office, but here in COVID days, we're all working from home. I don't have it with me, but it's a, it's a handheld device. 
Uh, and then inside this device, there's a sensor array. And then inside of this array, uh, there's a, 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 what's called a nanopore. Uh, a nanopore is, a pore is just a tiny hole in a membrane. Uh, the, the, the pore is actually manufactured using a protein that punctures through the membrane. This creates sort of an electrically charged, a, a, a positive side and a negative side when we apply an electrical force to it. And then as different molecules pass through this little hole, we can actually get some sort of electrical information along the way. So the idea uh, is that as DNA is going to be passing through this little tiny hole, uh, it'll sort of interact, the DNA will interact with the pore, uh, causing different levels of resistance. There's a known voltage. So if you have um, a different resistance and a known voltage, you can read out the current. In the same way that you can read current out on you know, a home electronics device, we can do this as individual molecules of DNA are passing through one of these very small holes. Uh, the, the sort of the level of sensitivity here is quite exquisite. Whereas, you know, your, I don't know, your computer will work in terms of current at maybe a few amps. You know, maybe you have a refrigerator that draws 50 amps of current. Maybe you have some electronics that draws, you know, maybe not an entire amp, but, you know, from a fraction of an amp. The level of uh, measurement here is truly exquisite where we can detect uh, changes as small as one one trillionth of an amp is the level of sensitivity that is necessary to actually sequence DNA. Once we take those measurements, we can apply um, a variety of algorithms that can then go decode the electrical signal data back into the individual nucleotide sequences. So ACGTs can be read off more or less as quickly as the molecule can go in and pass through the pore. It's quite amazing. It's handheld, it's quite fast, it's quite inexpensive. Um, I think it's very easy to imagine in the same way that we all carry uh, digital cameras and our smart devices. Um, it's not too uh, unreasonable to think about how in the near future we might all be carrying around DNA sequencers in our pocket uh, based on this sort of technology. So in my own in my own research, as I mentioned, you know, we apply these different technologies for a variety of different systems. We apply it for cancer research. We apply it for agricultural research. We also look at different uh, bacteria and fungi to go see, you know, all the different genomes are around us to be able to really understand uh, what their genetic makeup is, compare them, look at evolution, look at diseases, look at other sort of characteristics. But it's all sort of driven around the technology that is available uh, to be able to sequence DNA. So now that we've sort of had an introduction, let me pause here and just let me ask the audience, does anyone have any sort of broad questions about um, DNA, DNA sequencing, the human genome, before we dive in more specifically on some of these other projects? Let me pause here. Please go ahead and ask in the, in the chat if you have. Okay, well, well, that's great. I guess that was very understandable. So let me, let's keep going. So the next story I really wanted to focus in on has been uh, talk about some of the sequencing that's been going on at Johns Hopkins related to the COVID-19 virus. Before getting into the virus specifically, let me introduce a few concepts. Let me do this in sort of a very, um, hopefully easy and familiar way so that it'll be very understandable. So you, you may not think about this too often, but given two sequences, given two sentences, you can actually very um, uh, carefully measure how different sentences are related to each other. So here's a sentence, what is your favorite color to wear to the theater? Here's a very similar sentence, what is your favorite color to wear to the theater? And if you notice, there's just a few characters, a few letters that differ between one sentence and the other sentence. Here I've sort of, you know, I've made up this example. One is written in American spelling, one is written in British English spelling, but they're both you know, very recognizable. You can compare them, you know, just a few sort of letters that, that, um, that are different between these two sentences here. And we can do this for other sentences as well. If we kind of use your imagination a little bit, you can imagine having more or less the same sentence written in Spanish. Some of the words will be exactly the same. So color in Spanish is C-O-L-O-R, just like it is in American English. So that's very recognizable. In other scenarios, you know, there'll be more characters that are different. Uh, but for all these different sentences, it kind of carries the same meaning, uh, although there are some, you know, differences in how those sentences are spelled out, we can measure those differences. This is probably an unfamiliar concept, but we can do that, you know, a simple thing to do is basically count how many characters are different between one sentence and another sentence, and there's a, sort of different strategies for how you can count that. And then once you can sort of count how many differences there are between one sentence and the other, you can relate them to each other often in the form of a tree. And kind of the way to think about this is, you know, the American and British spelling are more similar than say, 
the same sentence written out in Spanish. You can imagine extending this to other sort of natural languages as well. Well, in the same way that we can do this analysis for, you know, for English and French and Spanish and other sort of natural languages, you can also do exactly the same sort of analysis at the level of DNA, except that instead of having, you know, uh, you know, the full alphabet and words and punctuation, it's basically, it's basically just going to be, you know, ACs and Gs and Ts, right? Where we can read off the genome from one sample, we can read it off from another, we can read it off from another. It's just going to be ACs, Gs, and Ts with no punctuation. But we can do the same sort of analysis where we just look at the letters, we can compare them, we can highlight the letters that are the same, we can look at, especially at the letters that are different across these different samples. So one very easy thing to do is if you have you know, uh, samples from people that you think might be related to each other, it's very easy to tell, say, siblings. Uh, you know, brothers and sisters will have very, very, very similar genomes you know, because they all share the same genetic um, contributions from their mother and father. They will not be exactly the same. There will be a lot of differences between them, but, but you know, siblings, their genomes will be a lot more, a lot more similar to each other than they will be to other cousins or you know, very distant relatives or, or unrelated family members. So that's sort of the basis for, you know, if you ever use 23andMe and it sort of you know, alerted you to new cousins, even distant cousins, this is a very straightforward and very reliable analysis to do just by uh, adding up and counting how many of the nucleotides are the same between, between you and other people. In sort of another, in a sort of, sort of slightly broader context, in the same way that you can compare and contrast within families, you can do this over different ethnic regions. So for example, the genomes of people from Northern uh, Europe are more similar to each other than the, than the genomes of people from Southern Europe. And similarly, uh, European genomes are more similar to each other than they are to say East Asians. Um, this is just sort of a fact about, if you look sort of historically about how um, human populations have settled over time, over, you know, over eons, because of, the, because of the way the settlements happened, you just get a lot more similarity in those groups than you will as you go across uh, other groups. And then finally, at the broadest context, in addition to kind of comparing within families and within different ethnic groups, we can even compare across species, where we can look at, say, the human genome compared to other primates. Those are very, very similar. And then we can compare it, say, to other mammalian species like the mouse genome. In the case of humans and, say, chimpanzees, we differ by only, we're, we're about 99% identical. We, we share 99% um, uh, of our genetic messages in our genomes are identical in the chimpanzee. In the case of the mouse genome, obviously it's a lot more different. Uh, we're only about 50% similar, although it's very easy to kind of recognize important genes in the human genome that through evolutionary forces are well conserved in the mouse genome as well. You can, uh, even though we're obviously very different from mice, uh, a lot of the basic genes, a lot of the basic cellular processes about how cells divide and grow and replicate and transcribe, a lot of those processes are very similar so that yes, we can very sort of successfully identify relationships between human genomes and primate genomes and mice genomes and many other uh, species as well. And it's all based on sort of looking at how many nucleotides, how many characters are, are the same or different uh, across all these different species. So it's, it's a simple concept. There's, a, there's actually a lot of sophisticated um, computational mathematical work behind it to sort of uh, uh, drive a lot of specific properties, but hopefully the concept is very straightforward and very understandable to all of you right now. So the genome, are, uh, so, uh, so one sort of amazing result from this is if you uh, look at the, the genomes of different people from say around Europe, uh, you could actually sort of just from the genetic information by sort of comparing uh, one person's genome to another person's genome to another person's genome, you can automatically uh, build essentially a, a, a perfect map of Europe just based on their genetic information. So on this sort of complicated chart here, all those, all those characters in, of different colors in the middle represents a person whose genome was sequenced. And then the color uh, represents where, uh, which country uh, did they uh, uh, come from. And through just looking at that genetic information and sort of um, uh, uh, arranging it so that genomes that are more similar to each other are, are sort of clustered together and genomes that are more distinct are separated apart, we can basically rebuild a map of Europe just by looking at the genetic information. So this is a very um, straightforward thing to do. You know, this result here was published more than 10 years ago. 
Today, you know, for ancestry analysis, we have exquisite um, capability to basically pinpoint, you know, almost down to the neighborhood that your family uh, originated from. Uh, what's complicated about this, though, is you know, you know, often, you know, people today, there's been a lot of sort of uh, mixing where you know you may have uh, ancestor ancestors from many different countries, and obviously, you know, if, if it's a mixture of ancestries. You know, you're not just going to localize it to one neighborhood. It's going to be a combination of many places all at once. But those methods are very mature. We can do that, and we can, you know, uh, sort of recognize your ancestry with great precision. Um, uh, and that's done, uh, you know, many, many millions of times over um, uh, a day in some of these companies. What I really want to focus in on, though, is another particular genome uh, that I think is is sort of impacting everyone's lives uh, today in a very, very acute and profound way. So what I'm showing you here, this ACGT is the complete genome of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus genome. It's an RNA virus, it's about 30,000 nucleotides long, uh, but you can sort of represent it in the same way where it's ACGTs um, about 30,000 times over. It's pretty amazing to me that something that will fit on one screen has actually totally altered the course of humanity. If you think about all of the you know, all the lives that have been lost, all the jobs that have been lost, all the shutdowns that have been necessary to combat it, all from this one little, you know, basically a few pages out of a book have really altered the world. So it's, you know, I think there's, um, it's, you know, it's of obvious importance every, as we would want to study this and, and want to learn a lot about it. At Hopkins, we've been really um, interested in this genome basically ever since it was first reported. Uh, we, there was a coordinated effort at Hopkins to leap into action to develop a strategy to be able to sequence the genomes, be able to analyze it very quickly, uh, look at things like, well, what is the genetic diversity of it? Where did it come from? Is, it, is, it, is the virus mutating over time in individuals? Is it, and then also how we wanted to be able to, to sort of map out how it's being transmitted you know, across neighbors um, and, and be able to see it at its, at its genetic way. In the same way that we can sort of draw trees about how you know sentences or people's genomes are related to each other, you know the, what I just showed you of the of the viral genome is sort of a representation of one of the genomes. There is a small amount of genetic uh, diversity there, and in the same way we can compare I don't know American spelling to British spelling, we can use th that same sort of analysis to to determine the origins of where a particular strain of the virus originated from. Now it's well, now well understood that you know, the original uh, transmissions all occurred in Wuhan and China, but as it's sort of moved around the world, it's taken on different dialects, if you will. In the same way, you can have a different dialect of, of, of say, English. Uh, we can see those same sorts of mutations in the viral genome. So we leapt into action. Uh, there was quite a lot of information that was known about the, about the genome when we started. Again, it's about 30,000 nucleotides long. Uh, it, it encodes and it does some very sort of fancy tricks in terms of this genome structure where it actually has um, uh, more gene products than actual genes that are present. It does, does some complicated molecular biology to make that positive. Uh, and it, it, is, it is sort of, you know, very recognizable which other genomes it is most uh, similar to. Uh, the, and then there's also been a lot of information that's been developed about how the transmissions occur. The virus itself, uh, those particles, you know, as we breathe them out or otherwise exposed to them, uh, they'll get sort of brought into our lungs and other tissues. On the surfaces of, of a lot of our tissues, there's a, a very important protein that is expressed called ACE2. And it turns out that the virus is very sneaky and very clever. It has figured out how, to, how the virus can dock to this ACE2 protein. That's uh, one of the most important um, interactions that take place in, in the transmission there. Once it's docked, there's other human proteins, uh, in particular, something called Tempris-2 uh, that, that sort of um, help for the virus uh, to be brought into the cells. Once inside the cells, it's, uh, the virus will sort of, uh, uh, sort of hijack some of the machinery inside of the cells to make many, many copies of the virus. And along the way, this will cause a lot of damage to the operation of those cells. So there's, there's um, this notion of viral load where there's a certain amount of viral particles that you're exposed to. Different people will expose different amounts of ACE2, those receptors that will be used for binding. Different people will uh, present different amounts of that Tempris2 that will help mediate uh, the virus being uh, brought into you. I think this largely explains why uh, different age groups, different ethnicities seem to have um, slightly different rates of infection 
uh, where they'll be exposed, even if they're exposed to the same viral load, um, they, they may ex uh, express different levels of ACE2 or other important proteins uh, that will sort of influence how effectively the virus will be brought into the cells and ultimately um, uh, uh, be replicated inside of them. So we were very interested to map this out and sort of look at uh, how the virus uh, was mutating over time. So the initial sequencing capacity at Johns Hopkins was established very early in, in very early March. Now, obviously we needed to do this in a very safe way uh, and also in a very sort of um, uh, accurate way. We didn't want to introduce any errors or have any mistakes into the process, but we were able to do this uh, very early in March. Uh, early in March and then into April, we really ramped this up where we could start to do, you know, larger and larger numbers of samples. Uh, and at this point, we've at, at Hopkins, we've sequenced hundreds of viral genomes. Uh, we're at kind of a steady state where we're sequencing on the order of about 50 genomes a week um, so that we can keep track of it. Uh, one kind of major result is the genome is by and large very stable. There are very few mutations, uh, very few new mutations that arise. Uh, most of the mutations, basically all the mutations that we have seen have just been sort of characteristic mutations um, from viruses that have been transmitted through different uh, countries of origin. So here is a sort of a, a summary result of the different sequences that we've mapped. And the same way that you can build trees of sentences or ancestry, we can build up trees about how the different viral genomes um, are related to each other. The, the complicated thing here is there is such little uh, diversity that over the 30,000 nucleotides, there may only be a handful of nucleotides that are different. So you get these very sort of dense clusters in the trees where the genomes are basically identical. So you can go to that URL, bit.ly uh, nextstrain.jhu, if you're interested to sort of look at an interactive uh, visualization where you can dive in deep on this tree and look at how the viruses um, that we've sequenced are all related to each other. Uh, one major result from this is we were very interested in, in the origins of these viruses. It could have been that there was a single introduction to the area, but instead of that, what we've noted is that uh, most likely there are multiple introductions to the area in the sense that of the viruses that we've been able to sequence, um, some of them very, uh, are very, very similar or identical to other viruses that are known to be transmitted in Europe. Uh, some of them are known to be transmitted around South America. Some of them have been known to be basically directly um, uh, transmitted from China uh, where, the, where the virus originated from. So I, this is not that surprising at this point. There's been other uh, sort of researchers that have looked at other metropolitan areas and they kind of come to the same conclusion that in these large urban centers, there's just a lot of travel, there's a lot of interactions, which just leads to the possibility of transmissions. Um, that's sort of interesting to note, although from a, a disease management standpoint is, is complicated um, because we just, there's just so much travel. I and mean, I think the right thing to do is really uh, severely restrict travel so that there are just uh, fewer opportunities for the virus to be transmitted. So in, in the so kind of main conclusion is there's multiple introductions. Um, some of the you know, patients that we had sequenced had travel history. So it was kind of understandable where it came from. Although at this point, you know, most of the transmissions that we see are local where it's you know, within a community, within neighborhoods, we see those transmission events occur. In terms of the virology, there's been very few mutations that have arisen. Um, and of those mutations, there doesn't seem to be uh, any really strong signal and that some viruses are more um, pathogenic than others or more easy to transmit than others. Um, they're all kind of by and large equivalent to each other. Now we're very sort of um, interested and a little bit concerned that as vaccines start to become available, that will encourage the virus to start mutating to avoid the vaccine response. So it's very important that we can maintain these um, uh, sequencing projects so we can sort of keep an eye on how quickly the, the viruses are mutating and then hopefully, you know, if those um, mutations do arise, we'll be well placed to address them uh, by um, uh, potentially developing a, a multiple vaccines at the same time. Uh, so now, and then in addition, we're sort of uh, watching all these transmissions and we're just very interested, you know, if there are uh, major events, we're very interested to see uh, how those transmissions are occurring between different people, hopefully keep track on, and keep close tabs on the virus so we can limit its impact as, as quickly as possible. Okay, so uh, that sort of takes us to the first major story. I see here on the chat, there's a bunch of questions. So let me, uh, let me dive in here. So first question from Bill, how much does it cost to sequence a, a full human genome? Great question. Uh, it varies depending on the technology and the level of detail that you want to use. 
Um, the most widely used technology for sequencing a genome comes from a, a company called Illumina. Their headquarters is actually in San Diego. Uh, it's their US-based company. Using Illumina sequencing and doing it at large scale, there is a volume discount. The cost of sequencing a human, human genome is about $1,000 or maybe a bit less these days. There are some other technologies out there that, off, that, that uh, promise to do this uh, cheaper. Um, if, you do, if you can do a lot of human genomes with that Oxford Nanopore technology, the cost per genome is actually below $1,000, although you have to commit to um, many tens of thousands of genomes at the same time. Uh, second question from Joey. What are the percentages of differences between human genomes across ethnic groups uh, roundabout? Yeah, this is a great question. It is actually um, counterintuitive. So if you look at a particular um, you know, position in the genome, you know, um, where it's either ACGT, there is no single position in the genome that is exclusively in one ethnic group or another. There is no nucleotide, you know, there is no A mutation that makes you, you know, Caucasian or African or Asian. You know, there's there's you know, there's just um, there's just enough diversity, there's enough sort of intermixing. There is no single nucleotide that is exclusively unique to one um, uh, ethnic group or another. However, the patterns in which the nucleotides are used over the course of one genome or the next are quite different. Um, there are definitely sets of patterns, sets of mutations, sets of polymorphisms that are much more common in, say, Europeans compared to Asians, compared to Africans. Uh, in sort of round numbers, between any two people on the planet, we differ by about 4 million nucleotides. Um, uh, although within, you know, people within an ethnic group may differ by a few million. And then across ethnic groups will be a few extra million. So there is a sizable number of differences as you look across ethnic groups. Although at a given nucleotide, you know there is no um, there is no single nucleotide that is that is exclusively found in one ethnic group or another. Uh, next question from Beth Bean: uh, What might the applications for a pocket sequencer be in the future? Will this technology play a role in precision medicine? Uh, yes, I think it will play an important role in precision medicine. In fact, that's kind of what the next story is all about. And what will be the applications for a pocket sequencer in the future? Well, in the same way um, that we all carry around essentially professional cameras in our smartphones, you know, I think there'll be basically limitless applications to, to carrying around a DNA sequencer. Um, maybe not for everyone initially, but as it becomes cheaper and cheaper, I think there could be a lot of interest to do so. Uh, today, there are, there are already something like this at sort of major transportation centers. Uh, if you remember, um, sort of sadly, if you remember uh, back in the early 2000s, there are all those cases of anthrax being transmitted through, um, through the mail. At this point, at major transportation centers, and in fact, I've seen these personally at, say, the D, in the, inside the DC metro uh, system, there are the machines that kind of sit in the corner and they're just sniffing the air. And what they're doing is they're doing real-time surveillance, uh, looking for major pathogens that may be present there. Other important applications today is for food safety. You know, there's been throughout the years a number of recalls, especially around like lettuce and other vegetables that grow out in the field, that get contaminated. Well, instead of waiting for people to get sick, maybe we can bring sequencing capacity to some of these fields and these farms so that we can ensure food safety. Um, that's another important application. You know, other ones can include for forensics, uh, for ancestry, um, just kind of just for fun. You know, if, if you've ever been out, um, I don't know, and you see a tree and you're not quite sure what sort of tree it is, or you catch a fish, you're not quite sure what type of fish it is. Imagine if you could just, you know, touch your sensor to it and then seconds later get a read off about what sort of species it is. We're not quite there yet, but I think these um, different technologies are not that far away, but all of this could be possible. You know, if you've ever seen that show Star Trek where you carry a tricorder and you can kind of do these measurements on the fly, we're actually not that far away from when we'll be able to, to, to have a tricorder-like device take all these measurements for you. Okay, next question from Fred. How does the genomics of the virus relate to the development of the vaccines? Uh, great question. So uh, the good news is, is for COVID-19, the virus is quite stable. And the hope is, from all of us, is that a single vaccine will be effective essentially against all the strains that are known in the world. This is quite different from say the flu virus. Uh, uh, if, you, if you know you have to get a seasonal flu vaccine, you might hear things like you know, H1N1 um, or, or H3N2. 
right? So in the case of the flu, uh, it's organized into what are called segments. And there are eight different segments and each of those different segments have different genomes associated with it. So the reason that we need a seasonal vaccine is every year there'll be a different combination of, you know, of, of, of one of many different segments all get sort of um, put together and you need a unique vaccine to sort of effectively treat that. Otherwise it can escape the immune system. So the hope is with uh, COVID-19, a single vaccine will be effective for all cases. But the thing that we're really worried about, really interested to keep an eye on is, is, is as soon as we start presenting vaccines to people at, at large numbers, this will sadly encourage the virus to start mutating more rapidly so that it can escape that, um, uh, that vaccine treatment. So that, that's, that's why we really wanna keep a very close eye on it so that we can respond to this in real time and hopefully um, keep track of that diversity that's present. And then the last question here from Peter, how do genetic therapies like CRISPR work? They don't edit the DNA in every cell in the body, do they? Right, so, uh, so there's a couple things here uh, to unpack. So CRISPR is this very, very powerful technology for editing DNA. In fact, uh, uh, some of the, two of the inventors of the CRISPR technology were awarded the Nobel Prize this year as sort of a sort of testament to how important it is. This is a revolutionary, this is a truly revolutionary technology uh, because it, it lets us, you know, edit, uh, make, let, lets us make arbitrary changes in DNA. There are some older protocols for changing DNA, but they're very limited. They're very sort of um, imprecise. But with CRISPR, we can say, yep, we want to change this particular nucleotide at this particular site from an A to a C or to a G or to a T. Just gives us exquisite control, almost at the same level of control as we have over software, where I can go in edit a piece of software and, and change it, the behavior uh, quite dramatically. It's a revolutionary technology, but it, uh, and it is now, um, you know, there's a lot of ethical considerations about how it can be used in humans. Uh, there is one report from China where it was used in embryos. It was, it was used to genetically engineer some modifications in embryos. As far as we can tell, those babies are now doing fine. Um, uh, although the sort of scientists there is in a lot of trouble um, because they did not really have the right ethical guidelines in place to be able to do these editings. The big challenge for using this, you know, kind of more broadly, especially for diseases uh, of adulthood like cancer is, you know, as Peter correctly points out, is that you have to deliver um, uh, the, 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 the CRISPR uh, uh, proteins and the CRISPR technology has to be delivered to every single cell that is that needs to be treated. So your body is made of about 10 trillion cells. So if you know if you had a genetic disorder where you needed to treat every cell, you would have to somehow figure out a way to deliver it to every cell. I think that's a really hard problem. Uh, the good news is that in your in your body, it's sort of organized where you have so-called stem cells, and these are the cells that 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 keep dividing, keep generating new cells. So the idea is if we could somehow deliver the CRISPR proteins and technology to those stem cells, it may be possible to treat the source and then eventually that would trickle out to all the cells in your body. That's a really hard problem. You know, that's gonna require years and years of research. Uh, today though, uh, the CRISPR technology is really, really important. Um, not, not so much for adult uh, genetic disorders, but things that, you know, that arise during early development uh, and it's also a great tool for basic research. You know, anytime we're working, you know, we're looking at, I don't know, plants or very primitive animals like worms or flies, and we, and we just are very interested in what would happen if we could change the DNA there. Now, finally, we have the technology that we can go in and change it with, with exquisite precision. We can actually, uh, you know, pick and choose which nucleotides are going to be changed, even out of the billions and billions of nucleotides uh, that are there. Okay, so uh, thank you for those questions. Let's, let's kind of keep moving through the presentation. I think it'll address um, some of these questions as we move forward. So the next topic I wanna to talk about is um, not infectious disease, but sort of more genetic disease. In particular, talk about cancer, talk about breast cancer. So breast cancer is, is a major uh, disease. It's a major cost, uh, cause of death in women. Uh, about one in eight women will develop it over their lifetime. Uh, family history is, is, is by far one of the most important factors. It's reported in about 20% of cases, but this is probably underestimating the true prevalence because you may not know about uh, cases that arise in your family. And then also um, some of the risk factors for breast cancer just may not present themselves uh, you know, on your father or on your paternal line. 
um, where they're, they're sort of more specifically at risk for women. Within high-risk families, it is now standard practice to screen for mutations in a few, in a few known uh, 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 risk factor genes, the most famous of which is something called BRCA1. Uh, this is a this is a um, it's a cancer gene that if there are mutations there can really um, enable uh, large scale mutations in the genome. Uh, for women that that know that they have these highly important mutations, um, there's a lot of sort of strategies that you can use to to manage the cancer. Number one would be more regular screening. In some cases, you can even elect to go through prophylactic surgery to minimize the, the possibility of developing uh, cancer. It's pretty gruesome to think about, but um, you know, sometimes that's really necessary. Some of these mutations basically are a 99% chance or worse that you'll go on to develop breast cancer. So it's really important to stay ahead of. What's, what's sort of maybe not as well understood is yes, breast cancer seems to be highly, have a highly, have a strongly genetic component. Some of the genetics are well understood like mutations in BRCA1, but the, the big problem is, is that only explains a very small percent of uh, breast cancer ca uh, cases. That only explains maybe one to 2% of cases through these uh, well-known uh, 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 breast cancer risk alleles. What that suggests to me is there's a lot of sort of genetics that have yet to be discovered. And that's been a major focus of my research group now is to apply some of these new genomic technologies to study these mutations in more great detail. One thing that is known for sure is that cancer, breast cancer, and other cancers are a disease of the genome, where uh, through a, a, a variety of processes, additional mutations will occur in the genome. This can be uh, individual nucleotides that can change. This can also be larger mutations that occur. In some cases, entire chromosomes are added on. Uh, chromosomes are fused together. Uh, other sorts of major rearrangements take place. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of almost, in some cases, like there's been a complete scrambling of the billions of nucleotides that are, that are um, present there. Uh, in sort of broad terms, the more scrambled the genome, the worse the outcome there often is for the patient, where many of the sort of normal processes that the cell goes through will be disrupted because of this widespread scrambling. So that much is known, but one thing that is surprisingly uh, less known is that exactly mapping out the nature of this scrambling, these so-called structural variations. Uh, the, 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 the protocols and technologies that are now used you know, for clinical care only give you sort of a, a very low resolution picture of the genome. Um, and, and because of that, we're probably missing a lot of important information that we hope to address uh, through the technologies and work that we have now. Uh, so to get started on this sort of analysis, we, we first, spoke, first started with a, a cancer model system. This is called a cancer cell line. In particular, we studied this cancer cell line called SKBR3. This is a widely used cell line for something called HER2 amplified breast cancers. So HER2 is a gene that is responsible and drives a lot of the growth of cells. What happens in some breast cancer patients is this gene is amplified, which will tend to make those cells grow very, very, very rapidly. There's a couple other key receptor genes that influence um, growth. You may have heard of ER or PR, positive uh, breast cancers. This is estrogen uh, receptors or progesterone receptors. So there's these three receptors that are really important for breast cancer. There's also something called triple negative breast cancer where, where none of those three receptors are amplified. But the cells we're looking at come from a HER2 amplified breast cancer cell line called SKBR3. I'll save you the details, but to actually do the analysis, we had to develop some very sophisticated software uses some very um, cutting edge uh, techniques in artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to be able to capture, uh, be able to match up the sequences we, we could derive from this cancer genome or other cancer genomes uh, to the reference human genome to detect mutations. Uh, I'll save you the details, but there's, uh, we have done a lot of work um, to develop those new algorithms and quantitative techniques to do those measurements. Here's sort of a map of the changes that we were able to observe in this one cell line. Uh, in a normal cell, there would be kind of no lines here. What we're drawing are all the places where the chromosomes have been fused together or otherwise large scale rearrangements had taken place. In the interest of time, I'm just giving the highlights, but, but basically using these new uh, single molecule sequencing technologies like Oxford Nanopore, like I mentioned, we could find tens of thousands of additional variants that had been previously been missed. We went back and we did a lot of validation for them um, to confirm our ability to detect them. And it was, a, it was an enormous improvement in sensitivity and accuracy over any other 
um, um, uh, 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 genomic sequencing technologies that are available. From this, we could detect many genes that were disrupted. In fact, we could detect many scenarios where genes were actually fused together that would just sort of have um, uh, very sort of altered uh, behaviors inside of the cells because of that gene fusion. Uh, we could also sort of, uh, sort of piece together which mutations occurred earlier or later in the cancer. Basically, we could unwind the clock to identify some of the very first mutations that took place. Those are gonna be the ones that drive the development of the cancer. Those are the ones that are most important to actually develop treatments for. Most of the others were so-called passenger mutations. That was done in a cell line, and since then, uh, about two years ago, and then since then, we've been really focused on taking these technologies and moving them into the clinic. And the way we've done this is uh, in, th in collaboration for researchers at Johns Hopkins, and then also some researchers at New York at Northwell Health, um, Health Institution, as well as Cold Spring Harbor, uh, from patients' tumors, we've been able to dissect them. Uh, and then we, what we do is develop what are called uh, tumor organoids. These are cells that we can grow uh, that are sort of like mini organs growing um, from the patient that allows us to do a lot of analysis on them. We can expose them to different potential chemotherapies to see how they respond. We can also do a lot of detailed genetic sequencing from that. That would be very difficult or impossible to do directly from the tumor. Uh, from those organoids, we did sequencing using uh, several different techniques so that we could really sort of carefully look at, you know, what, um, what sorts of mutations could we detect using new sequencing technology that were not recognizable using older technologies. Sadly, these are the technologies that are used uh, most widely for clinical care. If you've ever um, had to be sequenced for a cancer panel, it's going to be using these older technologies, especially from this company, Illumina. So here we are looking at how we can advance on this using new technologies. There's a lot of new software development that had to take place to make progress on this. Here's sort of one of the major results from this, which is a, a mutation in that famous BRCA1 gene that was only detectable using the new sequencing technology that was completely invisible to the older technology. There's a number of sort of technical reasons why that is, but I think this is just a really important testament where in some cases, we may, be, we may even know which genes to look at. We've just been looking at them in the completely wrong way so that we've been missing a lot of important variations that are present there. This was detected in, in one of the patients that we were looking at. And the study that we're doing now is we're trying to apply these same sorts of technologies in families that have very high rates of cancer. So here's what's called a pedigree, where from a single family, we can map out all the individuals that had cancer versus those that did not. All the ones that have those darkened uh, rectangles are family members that have cancer. This family here, um, sadly, has an extraordinarily high rate of, of early onset cancers, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, uh, melanoma, and ovarian cancer. This is highly unusual. This is uh, very atypical, which suggests to me, suggests to our partner clinicians, that what we think is happening is there's some very strong genetic risk factor that is present in this family that has yet to be identified. So we're actively in the process of using those new technologies to sequence the genomes of these family members so we can really try to pinpoint and isolate uh, what, are the, what are the risk factors that we had overlooked, hopefully give some new insight to them. Once we've identified those risk factors, we can then go screen additional family members, especially the younger family members that have not yet developed cancer to see if they also carry those risk factors as well and hopefully provide better treatments for them. So let me, uh, let me, in the issues of time, let me just very quickly tell you about a couple of things that are coming up next. And then at the end here, we can take some final questions. So what's coming next? First thing that's coming next is we continue to advance on the sequencing technology. Uh, that Oxford Nanopore technology has some very sophisticated capabilities where in real time, as individual molecules of DNA are being sequenced, we can decide in real time, if this is not a molecule that we're interested in, we can reverse the voltage on the nanopore, eject that molecule, and then allow a new DNA molecule to enter. Uh, to make this possible, we, my lab had to develop some very specialized and very sophisticated software that can decide in real time based on electrical signal measurements uh, if this is a molecule that we're interested in. Using this technology, uh, we were able to do a genome-wide analysis of all of the known um, genes that are associated with hereditary cancers such that we could study them much more uh, uh, quickly and much more cost-effectively. Our real hope here is to be able to develop an improved cancer panel 
that we can uh, deploy um, at very large scales inside the clinic um, so that we can uh, get a better assessment of genetic risk as possible there. In addition to being able to sort of evaluate in real time human DNA, we can also do this to look at uh, microbial DNA that is passing through uh, the nanopore. It turns out that microbes are basically on every surface. Most of them are totally harmless, but obviously if there's pathogenic um, um, uh, microbes that are present, or in the case of RNA, if there are uh, COVID-19 viral genomes that are intermixed with human RNA, you know, we basically want to be able to eject the human DNA or RNA as quickly as possible so that we can then go back and examine all of the non-human uh, uh, sequences that are, are, are there as well. So that's something that we're actively developing. Um, and I think this is going to be really transformative to the field where we can um, do this analysis very, very quickly in real time. Another thing that we're moving towards is increasingly larger data sets uh, where we're going to be looking over not just a handful of, of, of genomes, but over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of millions of genomes. To make this practical and possible, we're going to be exploiting a lot of cloud computing technologies. And I'm involved in two major projects using cloud computing technologies for large scale population wide analysis. One is called the Anvil, one is called Galaxy. And basically we're, we're building an entire ecosystem where we have large data sets, large numbers of computers, large software tools, all integrated so that we can do this very sophisticated analysis over millions and millions of genomes uh, very efficiently. And then the final technology that we're interested in, going back to some of the questions we've already heard about, are how can we use that CRISPR-Cas9 technology um, you know, for the forces of good to improve people's lives and improve the world around us? As a sort of an early example of this, working with our collaborators, we're very interested in a variety of plant species. What I'm showing you here is sort of a genetic cousin to a, a tomato plant. And this is the flower that basically all of the members of this family make. Um, the key thing that, to notice here is it always has five petals, those five dark regions. Every, every single um, individual of the species always makes five petals. However, through a bit of genetic engineering, uh, through a bit of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, we were able to genetically modify the plant so now that it makes seven petals. We knew exactly which mutations we needed to introduce. We knew exactly how to do it. This is completely harmless to the plant. It's just sort of a testament to how much precision we have in order to be able to do this. Um, obviously, we're interested to do more than change the shapes of the flowers. Um, we're also very interested to how we can um, improve uh, the nutritional content, the production of many plant and animal species moving forward, in addition to use this technology to treat disease. So just to sum up, genomics is increasingly important in modern life. We can map out your ancestors, your relatives. We can develop a lot of technology to improve crops and other foods. We can rapidly identify viruses and other pathogens. We can identify a disease risk, cancer risk, and, and for other uh, genetic um, uh, diseases. Ultimately though, we're, we're just moving into this era where we have a lot of detailed information about genomes such that we can you know, very, very carefully understand them and in some cases even safely manipulate them. A good example is how we were able to change the shape of the flower just by editing a few nucleotides that were present in the genome. It was a perfectly safe thing to do, but just as a testament to how much control and precision we have now. Uh, to do this, I obviously didn't do this alone in my own group and uh, I have a lot of great researchers that help me with this. Also a lot of great friends and collaborators at Johns Hopkins and a lot of other institutions around the world that have really made this all this research uh, possible. With that, I'll thank you. And I think we have time for maybe one or two real quick questions. Uh, otherwise you can find me on Twitter, you can find me online. Okay, so thank you. Uh, maybe here's a, a quick question from Claire. Given that we have ACE inhibitor drugs, do you think these will have any effects on the virus? Yes, in fact, that is one of the sort of things that is, is sort of undergoing some investigation is because there seems to be this relationship between how much viral virus particles you're exposed to and how much of um, the ACE, ACE proteins are being expressed, how much is docking play, taking place. Yes, that is one of the promising avenues is to see if we can disrupt that um, interaction between the virus and the ACE proteins. And then um, uh, uh, the last sort of question is, is that I have time for from Christine. How genetically different is the SARS virus from the previous versions that we've seen? This is a totally novel virus in the sense that it has a very distinct species. But if you build up that family tree of how the different genomes are related to, it is very closely related to other SARS um, uh, virus genomes. 
If you remember, there was a bit of an outbreak, maybe it was 15 years ago, although fortunately that outbreak was a lot more controlled and did not spread nearly as far. So thank you very much. I'm out of time for today, but you can find me on Twitter. I'm very active there. Uh, otherwise, I look forward to other Hopkins at Homes events in the near future. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you again soon.